Let me tell you a story. Years ago, when I was about, well, toward the end of my time at the seminary as a student, maybe I was in my end of my second year, into the third, Cynthia was carrying our child and, and uh, realized that uh, things weren't right in the pregnancy. And before we knew it, uh, her water broke and she was at five months. I don't believe I've ever shared this story. And uh, our hearts broke. We hurried to the hospital which was nearby the old Baylor Hospital and down by the seminary. And we sat in the hallway and, and the water was all over and someone came and gave us a room in a hurry and her heart was breaking and I was in tears. And we had one child and we had so looked forward to this second one. And so she went in and and was cared for at the hospital, but the heaviness of her heart put her in a depression that, that really took its toll and she wasn't getting better. Even in the hours we were there at the hospital following the procedure, I was concerned for her. So the, we, we were told there was a physician on duty that was uh, available to help us. He was a doctor of internal medicine, but also a, a, a counselor that we could, we could have, and he would be happy to come and talk with us. So we began a relationship with him. Uh, she was, of course, released from the hospital, but the depression didn't go away, and so we remained uh, somewhat close to this physician for a period of time. I noticed when we visited with him that he, on occasion, would have those barbs he would shoot in our direction. When he found out I was studying for ministry and she was going to be a minister's wife, uh, that, that set him off. He's clearly an unbeliever. His credentials were magnificent, very, very well trained. I think he was a Harvard Medical School grad. He had done his undergraduate work at an Ivy League school. Uh, the hospital held him in high regard and saw a real future for him. I became increasingly more concerned about his soul because he never missed a chance to take a shot at our faith. And I finally wearied of that. So I asked him on one occasion, could I meet you at the hospital and we, we have a bite of lunch at the cafeteria? He said, well, that would be great. I'd love to do that, Chuck. So uh, I met him there, and I'm thinking, Lord, uh, if this is the moment, give me the, the right words to, to speak to this brilliant physician about his soul. And I thought the best way to do that is a little simple diagram called the bridge. Some of you are familiar with it. There's a cliff on one side and a cliff on the other. This is our lost condition, and this is when we come to Christ. There is a righteousness imputed to us and, and a whole new way of life, and the, the chasm is bridged by the cross. And so that's the bridge in this illustration. So I said to him, Doctor, I'd like to show you uh, in simple words, what it means to believe as we believe. And I took a paper napkin from that uh, table and, and I opened it up and I drew with my ballpoint pen the cliff on each side and, and the cross in the middle. And I said, just you understand, as, as bright and as capable and competent as you are, you are lost. And without Christ, you, you, you can't know in eternity a relationship with God. And in order for you to get from this chasm, from, from this cliff to this side, you've got to go across the bridge. 
And you, you cross that by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You trust him. And when you do, your sins are washed away. Your whole life is changed from the inside out. And you become a brand new creation. He didn't say a word. He listened. He had his head on his, on his hand and was watching, looked up at me and watched, never interrupted. And uh, I said, uh, so my, Cynthia and I both care very much about your soul. And uh, as, as brilliant as you are, your, your brains will not get you make you right before God. In fact, I quoted from John 3, he who has the Son, S-O-N, he who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And I said, I would love for you to know a release from the wrath of God and enter into the life he has for you in Christ. And I paused. He reached down and grabbed the napkin, stood up, wadded it up, tossed it in the trash. Said, I just want you to know, Chuck, that in a thousand years, I would never believe that. It was the clearest example of rejection that I had ever known up to that time. And he tossed it in the wastebasket and walked out. And I thought, in a thousand years, you'll wish you had believed it. Because in a thousand years, you will know the wrath of God like you've never known ever in this life. You need to have the sun in order to have the life. If you will, I offered him the morsel, the gospel, as lovingly and as carefully and kindly as I could. <coughs> it didn't take him three seconds to reject it. As far as we know, he has never been interested. We saw him rarely following all of that. He really brought us little help. She recovered and moved on. We were pregnant again. We had our second child and then went on to have two more. But I've thought about that physician a number of times, wondering if he ever has turned to Christ. I pray that he has. Today, my thoughts are more on you. If you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus, if you've never moved from this cliff to that one by crossing over the bridge, today's the day to make that decision. Bow with me, will you? Just close your eyes where you're sitting. You don't have to join a church. You don't have to clean up your life. You don't have to promise to buy a Bible. You don't have to memorize anything. All you need to do is take the gift that the Lord offers you. He's made it so simple that the most ignorant individual on earth or the most brilliant can understand the message. If you have the Son of God, you have the life. But if you don't take the Son, of God, you do not have the life of God. Take the gift now. Accept it. Believe in Christ.